Dr. Taney, how are you? Dr. Taney, I don't <laughs> think I'll ever like not laugh at somebody who says that. <laughs> I think is, is he the first doctor on the chat, Fernando? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> it must be. Could be. Yeah. It, regardless, Could be. we're honoured. We're honoured. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's um, good. I'm good. Thanks. You're uh, you're talking to us from uh, Vancouver, and we'll get to to why you're calling from there. But obviously, you started out at Leinster. And it's fair to say that was like one of the, the glory periods of, uh, of Lens, the rugby. I think it was at least one Pro 12 and one ERC win you had during your time there. What were the, looking back on it, what do you think were the roots of that success? As you obviously got like a, a front row seat for it. Yeah, it's, it's funny actually though, because when I started, it was actually, like I would say a quite a dark period and mm-hmm. it was quite challenging. So when I was initially there, um, I wouldn't say it was a low period, but it was a transition period of like there was some players that had moved on and retired. There was some new coaches, some new st- like there was loads of change. And uh, I don't, one there was there were, I think the first year or the second year I was there was the year that uh, Leinster didn't actually make it through the European group stages for like the first time in, in a, a good few years. And it was when like there was a lot of young players that were coming through. So it wasn't all like you know, really successful and there were definitely challenges. But I, like for me as like, like you say, a front row seat and just like absorbing all of this, it was really interesting to see like the dark and really, really tough times and also some success as well. Um, and I don't attribute any of that to myself at all, but like just being able to see it and be part of it was really interesting. Um, and there was like, I don't think I could say that's particularly from, it's not from one there's not like one golden thing that oh like if you do this that'll that'll happen but there was just loads of other factors uh, like new coaches came in um new staff new players like new style and and all of those things and probably as a result of the dark period and like a reinvigorated like i wouldn't say even enthusiasm but like a drive to be like we can't have that happen again so it was almost like a sense of like urgency and and like determination so when um, when you came in, was it as a hybrid role from from the get go? You know, half kind of research sports scientist and then strength coach as well. So initially, when I started, um, I had done an internship previous to that in the college. So uh, if if people don't know, the Lens Rugby is like based in University of Dublin, so University College Dublin. And um, so I was in uni there, and I did an internship in the high performance gym there. And it actually there was one of the guys who is still a good friend and I consider like a mentor uh George he was my lead and he's where I think he's working in wasps at the moment in the UK but he's, he's worked in a couple of different rugby clubs as well um so I, I did that and I was a strength and conditioning intern there so the internship that I got in Lens was actually a strength and conditioning one and at the time there was uh another person there who's completing his PhD in sports science and there were some changes his role changed and um, as I got in and one of the feet sorry to go back to the internship in UCD one of the bits of feedback that I got from George at the time was that I actually needed to improve my like data skills because um, I guess I had weighted a lot of my focus on like the coaching at that time and he was like to, to become like a, 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 a competent or like fully rounded performance coach you need to have both of those sides which is always that debate and I don't want, I'm not going to get into that, like the controversial components of it but I was like okay great so when I went to the Leinster it was as an S&T intern first and then I started to adopt some of those um, I guess like sports science elements as part of that and then I was offered a, a sports scientist role off the back of it so probably yeah it's probably changed like that way but uh, throughout Leinster and even time in the FA it's been that hybrid role which I, I, I've really enjoyed because you get like elements of different things and it's it's fluid and it's like, I mean, it's busy as well, but like, it's interesting for me to get elements of like coaching, programming, research, sports science, that type of thing. I, I wasn't going to ask you this, but, you know, thinking about back in the day, like Dan Tobin, uh, Johnny at Ulster, they're like the two that I'm most aware of. But it seems to me that Irish sports science, strength and conditioning has always punched like crazy above its weight relative to the UK. Uh, I've heard a lot of people attribute this to like Satanta and, and Liam Hennessy, but do you think there are other reasons why Ireland is such a presence and such a force in terms of sports science? I don't actually know, to be honest. Like, I, I actually don't even know if I have an answer to that. I learned a lot from some of that, like Dan Tove and Tommy Turner, even Killian Reard now, he's in, he's head of performance in Glasgow. Like, I was very lucky to go in and like learn from a lot of these guys and 
but but also like Dan, he was the head at the time. Like I learned so much from him, but he he gave me like autonomy and things. He was like, look, I need you to do this. Go and do it. Um, so there were elements of that as well. So I don't know if like I think you know I I'd attribute like my learning curve to some of those guys. I'm sure they attributed to people who were there and and sort of mentored them. So I don't know if it's like. Yeah, there were, there were probably loads of names. Like you mentioned Liam Hennessy, like there's always like Des Ryan, who was prolific in Ireland. And he actually moved, he had moved to England when I think just when I started or maybe just before I started. So there's probably all those those people involved. But I, I don't know. Maybe it's because it's like there's, there's probably less opportunity in Ireland. Um, so sometimes people get experience in like some of the like football or soccer teams. I have to say soccer now because I'm uh, <laughs> on the Americas <laughs> mm-hmm. soccer. Um like there's there's obviously the four provinces there's like obviously other opportunities but there's so many opportunities in the uk so and obviously abroad as well so maybe i don't know by limiting opportunity in ireland you have to sort of branch out and experience different things and maybe that contributes but i actually i don't think i have an answer for that it's interesting um so i mean we we talked a little bit about this hybrid role that you had that you kind of evolved into that's really the thing that jumps off the page to me about your research is that you're not just interested in like myopic physical questions. You're actually trying to like combine the understanding of say like the tactical and the technical stuff as well as the physical. Was that, so for example, you know, what is what are the physical differences between a successful entry into the 22 and an unsuccessful one? Um, is that was that a conscious decision or you just kind of like evolve into that by just asking yourself different questions it was probably like the i was lucky that so i did a research masters like whilst i was working in leinster and like i think a lot of those um like embedded like i guess masters or phds or research whatever um i guess like title or or course you want to do whilst you're in a a full-time role like it's, it's it's busy of course but i think it's the best way to do it because you're answering or trying to answer actual questions and the questions aren't probably don't stem from me they actually probably stem from at the time it was dan tobin but also like the head coach and, and the coaching team and you know at the time we had like a certain call for when we got into the 22 and it was just to like okay we're in the 22 now we need to like ramp things up and as part of that we started look the coaches were looking back with dan at some of those entries and wondering like is there anything and the question was is there any like physical um like attribute or contribution that actually influences this the outcome of it now so that that one of those that paper that we did sort of tried to differentiate that now i'll say this here because we said it in the paper we've always discussed it it's never like you don't you're not successful in the 22 in rugby because of physical but it certainly contributes alongside all the other things when yeah. people saying like oh uh, peter Tierney said like oh if you run quicker you're gonna score yeah, tries yeah. which doesn't always work like that but even the discussion we had off the back of it we found in some of the successful ones our forwards had a higher like high speed running intensity and our, and but on the flip of that when our backs had a higher running intensity we were less successful so we were like that's kind of like why is that so we went back to the coaches with it and said okay we've tried to answer this but like this is what we've seen like what do you attribute this to and they actually attribute it to when like when we moved the ball or our backs moved the ball too wide or too fast um it actually resulted in our backs having to resource rooks and it took our forwards like our forwards couldn't get into position quickly so there's a few elements like that that um really helped inform like i guess the research we did but also like we asked the question back to them and it, it, that was sort of the way we approached a lot of the research in my opinion anyway yeah it's always interesting like that that kind of like chicken and egg thing like is is it the mass drives uh distance covered in a game or is it the distance covered in a game by the nature of your position that tends to push mass up as a result like all that kind yeah. of stuff yeah and, and even like what we did we did a video collision or like analysis of that and we found that when our forwards were involved in more collisions um that tended to be in those successful entries so again it was like i guess it is like a tactical thing as well like does that help inform how we play when we get into the 22 but that, that also is is quite um like squad specific so based off of the coaching team the tactics and the players we had at that time that was the differentiation mm-hmm. if you try to apply that now in Leinster I, I don't know I'm not there but like it might be very different because of the style and the players and the squad that are there so it's yeah it's, it's hard to like copy and paste all those things but I think the like type of analysis is interesting 
uh, along the um, lines of that is that paper you had between like the metrics on its own and like the difference between high speed running meters and, and efforts. Mm -hmm. So it, it's funny how, I mean, we try as an attempt because, you know, the research really never stops, but when you try to predict and explain or, or in retrospective link the data to the performance. And I remember having the conversation with players and I'll be like, if we can get the most of our decision making, our scoring running the least, then we're gold. Uh, we're probably not going to make the right decision every single time, but being fitter, covering such, such and such, like, like Kate would say, uh, it's simple, it's not easy. Then will give us, you know, that um, virtuous cycle in which, you know, least expenditure, we're more efficient, we'll make better decisions. And, you know, we, we're not, we, you don't want to go to the limit to get what you want, really, but you want to be ready to go as far as you have to go to get where you want to go. That, yeah. That's, I worded it out weirdly, but you know what I mean? Like, no, that exact. We've discussed that before, and I think that was part of my mass. I don't think we ever published. I might have shared it out before, but you guys will probably make a better graphic than I will. But like when we plotted like a quadrant of like say distance covered or like GPS involvements or GPS efforts versus like rugby involvements, so carries, tackles, rucks, passes. Um, the assumption in most quadrants is, oh yeah, top right is best. So really high GPS like involvement, really high rugby involvement, but. It could be, and there's no like right answer, but it could be like you say that like you want really high rugby involvement, but actually really low GPS output. So you're getting through more tactical work with less physical cost. And that was some of the discussions we had. There was one at the time when I was in Lens, there was one um, back row player who was really smart. He's really fit as well. Like, so he, he did a lot in training and he, and he was very aerobically fit, but in games, his physical output would be lower than the other back rows. But his rugby involvement was, just as high if not higher so that's probably the case that you're speaking about there where you know, that's watched, maybe the I ideal watched a japanese head coach try and drop michael leach for a 21 year old because the 21 year old had higher hsr in a game yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so, it, yeah i mean i wouldn't go that near to data because like you said it was just at the end of the day what what happened in the pitch if i were to pick one of our better games say like having you know a man down against South africa before finals they would run more because we had a man down no because the team had more composure so they you know they would run the clock they would ask for scrums they would kick to touch and maybe we were ready to run more than we needed being a man down but we didn't want to it was the smart thing to do was not to run more it was to make better like decisions and the good shortcuts not in the bad sense of like you know we're skipping corners but we need to you know <laughs> really uh, use our time in a, in a smart way and uh, what you might get from at least for seven is a very short period of time so there wouldn't be much difference but either the games we get trashed or the games we trash people uh, are the ones we run more but not necessarily our best play you know because in defense someone makes a break and then suddenly in a bad decision two defenders running backwards none of us none of them make the tackle but they still have the high meat so he worked really hard but we lost <laughs> yeah definitely were there any you know, traditional like paradigms or, or cliches that you actually found to be incorrect with your, with your research into, you know, measuring demands of sport, game performances, stuff like that? Um, I don't know if it's cliche, but like you see a lot in like the commentary and it is true in one sense that like international rugby is more intense mm -hmm. or it's like the highest intensity of rugby that you can get when you compare it to like uh, a pro 14 or, or like kind of a domestic league yeah. um, and the same so you you assume that like a british and irish cup so or, or like that type of league or like we had also like an a like an academy type of league mm. that's the lowest intensity and then you have like pro 14 or domestic league champions cup a european cup and then international and whatever the equivalents would be for southern hemisphere as well um but people i think when they say that they speak of intensity as like distance or speed so like meters per minute or high speed running because they're maybe the oldest metrics or the most commonly discussed yeah. but we found the inverse of that in that as competition level increased meters per minute and high speed running actually i'm generalizing here decreased and um in, and what we found uh, was that collision intensity so the number and the load from collisions increased mm -hmm. um as did like the efforts basically so in it, how I summarize this or try to summarize this really quickly is that in international rugby or higher level, higher competition level rugby, you have less space, but you're still required to do the efforts within that space. 
Yeah. And that's probably, that was linked to that sort of density piece, um, Fernando, that you spoke about, like that we did, that was like efforts over high speed running. In the same thing, we've done efforts over total distance and you include like collision efforts, high speed running, XL, cell. So the number of those relative to the distance that you cover in higher level rugby is, is higher. So you've more efforts in smaller space, basically. I've, I've heard that about uh, <clears throat> with England, like Eddie Jones, basically through through the the kind of like volume metrics out of the window including hsr for the reasons that you talked about yeah. and they're like well what's what's the one thing that guys are in in charge of and that was it was their axel d cell count per minute he's like you might not get up to that speed but we want to see you try to get there as soon as possible so that's like they have it's more like a an effort met, uh, yeah effort metric that they evaluate players on in training so true it's so it's so true i think but it's hard to it's hard to rid of the volume things because I'm, I'm not saying rid of them as in like you know don't even look at them but i think that's something that in the background we still need to be like conscious and aware of yeah from a management or a, a fitness or whatever you want to call that term but um i try to hide some of those volume metrics not hide them but just like as in yeah. i wanted the focus to be on efforts per minute in training and um just some of those more like like you say like intent or like intent related variables yeah but it's hard because whether it was like older players or coaches or staff whatever it was that were that were like maybe ingrained or had used a lot of these volume metrics in the past it's it that's that's definitely one of the challenges because when you discover not discover when you like discuss something not novel but like say what we're talking about here if this was like five years ago and nobody else has really researched or talked about it it's hard to shift some people who are like no we've used this or this this is what i'm used to seeing and um, so definitely that was like a challenge definitely and that was like tough to balance like trying to shift people towards i guess a new focus but also still engage them with stuff they wanted because you still need them to actually go to you to, to have a conversation about external load and gps and that type of thing it's it's like it's like you got coaches being like hey you nerds got us uh born these metrics and now you want to change them what's up <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, if you watch like the reason like six nations and, and test rugby in general it seems more about corroding defenses and attrition than clean breaks and running it's just that the ability of keeping the intensity and the the number of contacts and there's so much violence in such little space. I don't know if the uh, defense has got better, the guys are bigger, or all of the above, but, it, you know, running volumes wouldn't be that much related to success unless, you know, in the top 10 at least, I wouldn't see that many breaks, wouldn't, wouldn't we? Like, the top speed stuff, you still need it, but I don't think it would be, like, descriptive of game outcome. Yeah, well, so some of the clean breaks in the European Cup anyway, in like the one or two seasons that uh, we analysed, it did seem to differentiate wins and losses, but they're just harder to come by, I think, because like at international and even at European level to a degree, but international level, you're playing against like the best players in the world. And like, you know, their defensive system is so like pressurising that like it is hard. So it, I do, I think they're still important, but they're just less common, probably like the the max speed exposures it's not to say they're not important they're just maybe a little bit less common but that was definitely like another reason why we tried to go like some of the lads were slagging me for like bringing in momentum here but like I, I seem to ramble on with this loads and I remember at the time like you really like tied to like momentum gate because lads were like oh you just like what are you talking about this thing for so long um but like we tried to or like I thought that momentum could be used in sleds because what like obviously we were getting max speed exposure through our speed training but in terms of like horizontal force application or that sort of like Excel carry, like, I guess I don't want to use the word transfer. Cause then like, it's just all, everyone starts like discussing like, Oh, transfer <laughs> exercise in the gym of that. But like as an exercise that helped orient players towards better body positions, that was, that was like the, the reason for trying to relate some of the momentum in the gym to momentum on the pitch and stuff as well. Interesting, man. So with, with this trend, or it, it's almost like a trickle down in terms of technology. So it, GPS used to be the preserve of all these like high level international pro teams. And then it starts to go down to like, you know, championship, that one, that two. And now it's, it's not uncommon to see private schools, certainly in England. I don't know about Ireland. You see high schools in the U S for football that have GPS systems. And you talk about this, the shifting trend in, in metrics. What do you think are the big rocks? So if somebody listens to this and they're about to get their first GPS system, what, what are the big things that they need to be looking at in terms of monitoring? 
yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna use the cop out like it depends and then you're like yeah. oh, shut up. <laughs> but like so yeah it, it does slightly depend because like what like okay in a high school for example um yeah there is some schools using gps in ireland as well from my experience so it's not just in england it, it seems to be sort of like worldwide i guess um like is is the purpose of gps when you're in high school to bring or to try bring success in high school or is it to actually progress the player to get to an academy or a professional or or elite environment because i think they're two different things and it's not to say you can't do those things together but like the discussion we've had okay so different competition levels have different demands so for international rugby i would i would weight very heavily on collision efforts um but that that isn't necessarily the same for high school because even in some of the british and irish cup analysis that we did it was a really really fast game loads of high speed running so it's like so in in a british and irish cup game i might suggest okay well high speed running intensity is actually really important because we're seeing a lot of that in games but we're seeing way less of that and way more collisions in in international so i guess it kind of depends but also then if you train too much for for example if you're in that british and irish cup or high school level if you train too much for high speed running without an eye on the future for that player like are you res- are you holding them back because if you train so much in high speed running you're probably limiting the amount of mass that they can put on like if i'm going extreme but then if they get an academy contract and all of a sudden they're playing in a domestic league pro 14 or english premiership and all of a sudden the high speed running intensity drops but the collision intensity increases yeah. you haven't actually prepared them for the next step so i'm gonna I'll, I'll stop rambling but that's my sort of like it depends like side answer to to what you've asked it's funny you mentioned i uh, i forgot to mention it earlier but talking to uh, eric Corrin, who i used to work with and there are other people that worked in the sec in, in college football eric was telling me that he he went from the sec to the nfl and he said the first thing that stood out to him was just there's no time or space to do anything like you have the ball and it's just like whoop, it's like a swarm on you and i think if you look at the data in most years it's uh you know anything in the mid 22s 22 miles an hour uh, to like 23 you're going to be the fastest guy in the nfl but then having spoken to other people that worked in college uh it would not be uncommon for you know five six seven eight guys in one team to hit 23 in a year which is i think it's you see a similar pattern in football as well as um as well as rugby in in terms of gps what do you think are going to be the the future metrics or the future developments because one of the things that's always bothered me is that when we look at GPS in rugby, it's always such, uh, or it has been such a running based focus, but you're not accounting for those static efforts like rucking and mauling. Do you think there's, we're ever going to crack that? Yeah, that's, I think definitely. And like from even some of the collision validation stuff that we did, like some of those inertial sensor derived variables. So again, you'll still have distances and whatever speeds and velocity, they're still important, but I think there'll definitely be a shift with like, better algorithms that go way over like my head or brain (laughs) to even comprehend with better algorithms and the inertial sense, they sample at much higher frequencies. So they're a little more sensitive. So I think if smart people are (laughs) going to get their heads behind this, like a lot of variables derived from that. So we did start to look at some change of direction based stuff as well. Um, that I, I, you know, there's always like when you're in, you have like all of these little projects you're like, Oh yeah, I'll do that, do that. And then that was one that we did and I never got to the end of, I must dig it out now. Um, we're trying to look at some change of direction based stuff. Um, I think stuff like that. Yeah. So like collision change of direction, some of the static, I know some of those GPS companies are working on like static algorithms for scrum. Um, I don't know if they've cracked mall and stuff yet, but, and then you, I guess for Rook, which are the, like, if you ask players, these are the most fatiguing things of, of their game. Yeah. Like the collisions, I guess, account for the rook involvements. But yeah, certainly, I think it'll go slightly towards, it'll be more balanced. Instead of having loads of GPS derived variables, it'll have a little bit more weight on the, the inertial sensor. Yeah. I, I guess, it, would you say that it's just going to be like from like a tilt in the axis that they just use that to infer a scrum or a, is it? Because I think there's some systems they infer a collision from like a rapid change in orientation, right? Yeah, that's. I think that's what I think. Catapult has done that with this with the Scrum algorithm. It's like at certain time to set, and then they know it's a Scrum. And I think they have. I think it's quite um quite a good like accuracy. And then yeah, a lot of the collision work is either from like a really high impact, or um yeah from like a change in orientation. Uh, but some of them have changed now in the last few years. I think of how they detected on certain thresholds. Yeah. 
So what, what prompted the move to the FA? Was it you, you were looking to move or they asked you to move or how, how did that happen? Uh, I actually got a, a message on LinkedIn. So uh, for everyone that says LinkedIn is pointless. Uh, and up until that point, I was like, do we, like, do we need LinkedIn in like, I yeah. guess, like the performance coaching world? And I never really knew, but uh, I got a message from LinkedIn, um, probably just like a wide scour of messages, probably a copy and paste from a recruiter who was working with um, the FA. And yeah, so I wasn't like looking at the time. Um, that came up, had a couple of phone calls, um, and then just heard a bit more about, well, I heard where the, where the opportunity was, um, a little bit about the role. And then I spoke to some people there um, about it. I spoke to Bryce, who is, is still head of performance there. And, you know, he, he's like really good guy, good practitioner and like really interesting, like how he had, he had been there with the two bends and sort of built this like really unique department and i don't know if i've seen or heard of any like department that operates in the same way i'm not saying it's like oh it's better but like as in this the structure and how we operated it i don't know if i've heard of other kind of i guess yeah like insights to that so when i heard that and i spoke and i spoke to a few different people as well and different like mentors and and whatever at the time um and then yeah i went over um in a really busy week actually for an interview so the interview structure that they did and, and we've done in the FA is really like, I think is really well rounded. It's one of the, it's one of like the better interviews that I've heard of in, in sport. Um, but it was during a European cup week. Wow. Um, and so, I, so like, look, I was always, as soon as I had a consideration or phone call, I was always very like upfront with like my manager, Charlie at the time. And even um, Leo and Guy, like head of rugby and, and obviously head coach, like I, I went into them and I spoke to them and I said like, look, I've had a conversation here so I wasn't like you know I wasn't going behind anyone's back or hiding anything so as soon as it got to that point I was like yeah but then um yeah the interview was on the European Cup week and it was on a match I remember it so specifically it was on a match day minus two which would be quite a like a really high energy day for us and one where I think like in Leinster anyway the, the performance staff had a huge role to play because it was a really fine balance between like I guess like not potentiating but like getting them ready for that final training day but yeah. not doing too much to like fatigue them yeah. so anyway it was that day and flew over and ended up yeah getting offered I think like the week later um so it just uh, like it seemed really different like yeah like the department seemed amazing like really diverse backgrounds the role was really interesting because again it was like that hybrid role it was sort of okay when you're on camp it's you you're the sort of like camp head of performance or lead s and c but then there's also these project components uh, one, it was like a step. I did a lot of delivery on the women's side. So it was like a different sport. Um, I also had male and female experience. So there's a load of different incentives or draws and, and a bit of a change. Well, I was in Lens for five years. Um, and so that I wasn't, yeah, like I wasn't looking at the time, but a lot of those different factors seem to fall into place. Um, so yeah, that, that was some of the reasons that I decided to go there. In terms of that, like develop, uh, sorry, that like departmental structure, was it the, you know, Bryce, was, he was at Melbourne Storm, right? No, not Melbourne Storm, Melbourne Rebels, sorry. Yeah, and he's, and yeah. Monster, he's been all over the place. He had a pretty yeah. unique background himself, yeah. It, was it like, kind of like a centralised model where you're, you're um, working with all the teams, you know, from like the, the adult first team all the way down to the youth departments? Or is it, is it more that the, the kind of the men's first team is, is a, you know, a, a group by themselves? Because I know over here in baseball you can have a head of performance that actually does has nothing to do with the major league environment and then it's every other team so i'm just kind of curious yeah. as to how that works yeah like so there were certain staff with the, with the senior teams but um the, when i spoke about like the projects that not just me we did as as yeah. like employees there those projects uh, informed and provided structure and insight and like I guess programs and stuff to all of the teams so the example that I use is like I was um, part of the other 22 hours like recovery sleep and nutrition type of project and that project had to account for both men's and women's sides but from under 15s right the way up to seniors now obviously what we were doing on camp with the senior men or women was very different to the 15s but there was a connection and like I guess the language we used and the terminology and the branding of Whatever, presentations or that type of thing was all the same so that was one of the unique things about those projects and that even at the time I was delivering to like the women's side but I was also helping Ben and Steve um, and Steve Kemp as physio um, 
planning some of the recovery for the men's euros at the time because i was part of that project so like you had you had like just really interesting like components of like okay i'm i'm working with um, one of the women's teams and i'm planning for their euro cycle so from a, like a performance s and c perspective i've got a lot and then i needed to go to other staff so i went to martin evans ben rosenbach look they were leading a training solutions like strength oriented um project look i've got this project i could go to them and say look i've got this much of a lead into this campaign this is the profile of of my squad how would you approach this and we could like i guess knock heads together i could go to james Morhan, chris rosman's nutritious and say look how would i feel how do we how do we help educate these players for this camp so you could sort of lean on other people with different experiences and also different projects so that was like one of the really interesting things so whilst on camp there was the same sort of people delivering behind the scenes was a lot of like moving parts and different exchange of ideas what was that cultural shift like was it a big difference from from rugby or was it quite a comfortable one for you um it was it was very different and like the initial uh, I'd say challenge is like the language component. And I think people speak of this, like, you know, Nick Winkman speaks of it all the time, but how like the importance of language, but mm. adopting football or soccer language straight away is different. And like, I've used this example of speaking to somebody before, and it's a really like simple example, but like in rugby, you would speak of like attack and defense in soccer or football, you speak of in possession, out of possession or transition. And it's like a really minute thing, but, like when you're speaking to coaches and players, if you keep speaking in like a previous language that you've used from rugby, they're going to just associate you with like, oh, like what he has, he's not even like talking the same way as like that type of thing. So it's very conscious of that going in. And that was obviously tough to like learn quite quickly. Um, even like set play versus like freak, like just all these little tiny things. And that's just the example, but that was challenging. But in terms of culture, like I found the FA a really good culture. Um, but, and I won, like people ask me that like football, question a bit um but like again i guess my experience is different because it's like the international environment is different anyway um and also from a department perspective what i guess i i say what bryce has created and he'll be like no it wasn't just him but like i attribute a lot of what he created is is like he was the lead of the department like was we had such a diverse group of people and stuff it was like every time we got together it was such a learning experience and it was so interesting and um, so i would have said our department culture was brilliant that it was like a lot of responsibility and accountability, but also a lot of autonomy in how you approach that. Um, so like, yeah, there was some really, really good things about, about working with that crew. And, and look, I still stay in touch with a lot of those guys and girls and, and consider them good friends as well. So, Also, yeah, it's got to help that uh, you get to, to work in a place like St. George's Park. You know, I, I spent two weeks there during the Rugby World Cup and it was absolutely nuts to see the yeah. uh, money they put into that place. Oh, it's incredible. Although two weeks is maybe the longest you do in one go. You need to get out there as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you do, a, if you do a camp there for a while. So we actually, again, like, and probably goes back to the, what I just mentioned around like the autonomy or, or um, that type of work. Like we were, our department, even before COVID operated typically on a structure that we'd be in St. George's Park a couple of days a week, and then we could work from home a couple of days a week. Now, part of that was one, the flexibility, but a lot of people in, in like the department that I was in lived like all over the UK and yeah. um, so you'd go there for a couple of days and then go but also because we were on camps like <clears throat> I did camps across the UK Loughborough up north um we've been in Manchester's department I was also in Bosnia Ireland UF Florida for camps so like you do periods away as well so not everything is in St George's Park most of the senior men and women's training is in St George's Park um, but a lot of the underage teams um, or youth teams could train anywhere in the UK or anywhere in the world as well interesting so what, what prompted the move to uh, Lily Lemon? Yeah, so another, another one. I feel like I'm just repeating myself, trying to discover things. Um, it was, again, like, and I know we spoke with this kind of earlier on, but for everybody else, um, it was, yeah, I was in the, the FA two years, and I just felt like it was, like, time for, like, a new sort of, like, challenge. And it was, there was a few, like, restructures that were going to happen, like, this season. And I was like, oh, like, you know, I was brought in for like a very like specific kind of role and some of that it was going to change um and then I just sort of I, I guess like I don't say like that's the reason that I was like oh that's the reason I came to do the lemon because I had conversations with a lot of different like sporting teams and stuff and I guess like it prompted me to maybe like take my head out of the water and look around and see what was maybe there for me and it mightn't have, it mightn't have been for a year or two but um yeah I had a few conversations with uh, different sports teams some were really good some were really interesting and then 
like I guess I've had I've like always had an interest like my degree was health and performance science so it wasn't just sports science or, or strength conditioning and then even through like the research and stuff that I've done the GPS technology some wearable technology that type of stuff like I've always had an interest in a lot of that stuff and, and a, from a health perspective so then I was like oh maybe there's an opportunity like outside of sport like directly outside of sport um, and then yeah I just I literally saw this job shared out by somebody on Twitter um the the best uh, platform in the world for, for uh strength and conditioning um and just sent a message inquired about it applied and i guess when i saw it obviously i saw the kind of job description and it was it it, it really piqued my curiosity in like oh wow that's like really interesting and then i would obviously heard of lululemon as a brand it's not as big in ireland or it's getting much bigger now and then when i saw the there job right now <laughs> oh there you go <laughs> um i'm living in this stuff now um so yeah when i saw that and then i started speaking to the people and then as part of i guess like the first couple of calls i just found myself like going online looking up stuff about like this department and the company and and then i had like more calls and as each call progressed my like invest my like emotional investment in the company start just grew and i was like god this would be so interesting and really unique and it's different from what i've done before um and it, yeah it's just like there was something like i think i said this in my final interview as well i got asked the same question i was like why do you want to join lululemon and i listed obviously a couple of like specific reasons and i said to the he was the lead of the department at the time i was like there's some it just feels right i don't know how like if that holds any weight you'd probably be like what are you talking about but like it just felt right at the time and yeah like i've I started, I did start remotely for a couple of weeks before, uh, at the end of 2021 and for the last, I guess, like two, three months or whatever it's been, um, it's, yeah, it's been, it's been amazing. Like same thing, department uh, is, is really, really good so far. Um, like we've got, again, accountability, but autonomy. Um, and yeah, it's a big, like, I guess, like cultural or life change as well for myself and my missus as well. We, we've both moved and relocated to Vancouver, so. Is, so just to try and get a little bit of insight into what you're doing, is it the the integration of sports science technology into the clothing or is it more like an alongside kind of thing like uh, Spark with uh, Nike? No, it's it's probably not even um, specifically like sports tech or sports related. So the, the role um, our department is with like under the product innovation arm of the company. And there's a few, there's like three different branches and I, I'm explaining this, but I'm still like learning the landscape as well, but there's a team of futures and they look at like product or like, I guess, product opportunities or whatever it is, 10 years ahead. So what will Lululemon make in 10 years or what will Lululemon acquire or build or produce or service? And then there's on the other side of that, there's labs and they do a lot of like on their go to market testing. So products that are coming out in the next two years. Um, labs do a lot of testing on those uh, for, I guess, like those performance claims that you see when you buy like Lululemon or, the, you know, the, the things that support the product. And then a team that I'm on is Advanced Concepts. And that's the team that looks, I guess, like three to five or that sort of middle ground between the other two teams for um, future like insights, research um, for like future product or opportunities. And that might be anything from like materials testing, human testing, raw materials. I mean, in some capacity, there's probably some wearables and, and technology, of course, involved in that. But it's it's like quite a change of even of like what I'm researching in day to day. But I guess one of the one of the things to go back to like the job description or interview kind of question was and they were looking for a researcher who could work. I said this before, I think, in like kind of a fast paced way because product changes like pretty quickly. And there's always like something changes very rapidly. Yeah. Um, but also they wanted like the applied research skills so as opposed to having like I don't have a domain expertise in like material or, or apparel or clothing but I hope I bring like a research skill or like a way of researching or thinking from my PhD or from sport experience and from team experience that can be applied to this so there's people with different backgrounds here as well who are all good researchers really curious people different thinkers and hopefully us knocking our heads together it results in some really cool product innovation you know, it's interesting, as you were talking, I was thinking about other companies that have done similar to so like Under Armour bought MyFitnessPal, Whoop bought Pushband, and now they've, they're starting to produce clothing where you can insert sensors into the clothing, stuff like that. It's really interesting to see like these big brands that they're starting to like 
go out and buy other other companies and incorporate them all together and i think like get more vertically or uh, integrated it's pretty yeah pretty yeah it's, it's pretty interesting to see so and like even those like pique my interest about i'm like wow that, that's so interesting to see like why do they acquire that and like what's going to come of that in the next like five years so it'd be really interesting to see what happens awesome man so where can uh, people find you online as we're wrapping up uh yeah so i'm on i'm on twitter um i'm on twitter and instagram and linkedin um so happy to try like to kind of if i come across something interesting try to share it out or have a bit of a discussion um i don't i wouldn't say i have any like particular like like particular niche that i share out, but just something that interests me i kind of like oh this is pretty interesting maybe other people find it interesting so i'm on twitter uh linkedin and instagram i think your your uh, your twitter is definitely one of the best ones out there in my opinion Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Slightly different uh, interpersonal style to myself on Twitter, but nonetheless, excellent. <laughs> it's just uh, le- less memes anyway. <laughs> awesome, man. Thanks for your time today. Yeah, right, thank you very much. Back to you guys. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.